there have been few filmmakers better able to show the politics of denial and the dynamics of power more effectively than Pablo Larraín. Across his nine films to date, he's forged a wonderfully eclectic and stylistically impressive body of work that dissects the mechanisms through which abuse operates. Films that are defiant, brilliant, evocative, and surprising in their audacity and difference. From his earliest film, Fuga, Fugue, in 2006, Pablo Larraín's work has been centered on issues of legacy, memory, creativity, and impunity. At the center of all his films are brilliantly drawn characters from the psychopath Raúl Peralta in 2008's Tony Manero, obsessed with the character played by John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever, to the grieving Jacqueline Kennedy, dealing with the immediate aftermath of her husband's assassination in 2016's Jackie. Larraine's characters are often positioned at a moment of emotional crisis, in situations where they forge a piece of history. And it's often history that is written from the margins or the peripheries, focusing on that which doesn't get covered in the official chronicles. Pablo Larraine's films matter because they're concerned with how history is constructed, whether it's the final period of the Pinochet dictatorship in 2012's No, which dramatizes the 1988 No Referendum campaign that helped oust Pinochet, or how myths are forged, and as in his 2016 Neruda, both a study of Neruda's public image and a wider consideration of the schisms in Chilean society that came into play with a Pinochet coup. We're delighted to be screening his latest film, Spencer, at this year's London Film Festival. It's also a work centered with mythology, offering a contemplation on Princess Diana's final Christmas at Sandringham in 1991, as she prepares to separate from her husband, the Prince of Wales. This is no traditional biopic, but rather a bold imagining of what might have happened with fiction taking center stage as Kristen Stewart's Diana refuses to perform the role of dutiful wife, staging a defiance against the expectations of an intransient establishment keen to adhere to particular traditions that cannot be questioned or altered. Diana's individualism, like that of the title protagonist, Emma, in his 2019 film, propels Spencer into a space where humanity is celebrated and liberation is possible. Pablo, many congratulations on Spencer. Um, at times it's eerily gothic, darkly comic. It's a hugely individual film. Um, the opening credit I was intrigued by where it says some, um, it's a fable from a true tragedy. Was this something that very much governed your approach to um, handling the material that, uh, that you collaborated with or, or with, or with um, the screenwriter Stephen Knight uh, in adapting the, the whole myth of, of Princess Diana and focusing in on a very particular period, three days. Well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Maria, and for, for, the, for the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I, we, I think that I have never really worked around uh, proper biographies or biopics. I, I have done movies around people that actually existed and we can discuss this, that later, but specifically in here, from the very beginning with, with the producers and everyone that was involved and including, of course, Steve Knight, we wanted to, um, to make a movie that felt like a fable, like that, that could assume in its, in its more internal process that we're, we're basing the story in some things and elements, uh, historical elements that can, can be considered as accurate, but most of it, it really, it's a fiction, it's a work of fiction. And we know so much about Diana, I think. There's so much around. And at the same time, we know very little about the royal family because they're so discreet. That once the, the doors are closed and you're inside, uh, all you can have and you can do is really work around, you know, fiction. Um, and we wanted to make a movie about a lot of things, uh, but mostly I believe it's a movie, a movie about motherhood, I think, and a movie about, about how can a woman understand that the most important thing that she has is first of all herself, and and her own children and her own sort of in family and and 
And that's how we wanted to do, that's what we named the movie Spencer, which is a key in the story. It's how she recovers her identity and her family name. And, and there's nothing really more powerful for, for herself and stronger for herself than, than, than who she really is. And yeah, I, that's what I think it is. It is, it is a fable um, that can probably make people think that she was very loved and that she had a, you know, moments of, of darkness and difficulties that we probably know, but she had a lot of light sparks uh, on her life. And, and I think uh, this movie kind of transits in, 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 those, in, in those elements. I th I'd say that um, the, the movie, I don't want to spoil it, as they say, but it's structured um, as, as, a, as, first of all, someone that is a, in a deep crisis that then it becomes a little bit of a psychological horror, even to a ghost story. And then by the very end, we get to understand that there's a chance of healing. And, and it, it gets, she gets into this healing process that I, I think it, it, it works in the way that, that we see it. But yeah, it's all based in Incredible Script by Steve Knight, who did a terrific job writing it. You spoke about uh, the role of motherhood in the film, and, and you've referred to the film as a testimony to your mother and to all mothers. I mean, tell us about the relationship between your mother and Princess Diana that, that led you to well, make that statement. It's, you know, I, it's, 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 well, I can speak, of course, on the relationship in between my mother, but I think it's, it's, it's her and, and millions of women around the world. That's, that's what I think is fascinating. I, I grew up, you know, with, with her, you know, her presence and this sort of world icon um, that everyone was so interested in her. And of course, my mom was one of them. And I would, was wondering what, what is, was my mother seeing in, in, in Diana? Why would she care so much about her? Why would she follow her? Why would she be interested in her, in her life and in, also in the way she dresses and, and, and her fashion and, 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 and her, I don't know, the way she cut her hair, whatever, many things. And, and, and as, grew, as I grew up, I, I got to understand that even though that she was born to privilege and she was born, you know, near and close to the royal family and ended up being part of it in, in some capacity, she was always a woman that was very regular somehow and, and, and very ordinary, if you could say something like that. Yeah. And, and, and so she was always a very regular person somehow in a very, you know, unusual circumstances and context. And that probably made her, you know, um, feel close to millions and, and not just women, probably men too. And, and um, so I, I, you know, I, as, especially when we decided to make this movie and I started reading and doing my, my research, we were wondering, or specifically me maybe, why, why was she so attractive to, to many people? And, and it's, it's very hard to answer that. And, and I think she, she created this sort of huge amount of empathy throughout very simple things and also throughout a huge amount of mystery. I think she was a very enigmatic woman, even though we might think that we know a lot about her, but the more we try to learn from her, the less we really know. And that enigma and that mystery, uh, led us to to another element, which is was to find the proper actress that could carry on with that mystery. And 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 I think we we were very lucky to to find Kristen, who did a beautiful beautiful work. But and then also something that I discovered during the process of shooting the movie is that well, I am a father myself, and so when we were working with the kids, um, uh, Jack and Freddie, who play William and Harry, in the movie. While they were, you know, performing and, and, and being in the set with us, I kept looking at them and, and, and I kind of understood better the movie and why I was making that movie thanks to those kids. I, I got to understand that they were there thanks to that mother and they always felt protected thanks to the mother that they have. And probably that's my story and probably is most people's story and, and how, you know, your mother can be such a, a strong element in, in, in your life. I'm sure it's not the case for everyone. Uh, I wouldn't want to make a rule, every, every story is different, but 
but in, in, in the case of those kids, I felt highly connected with them because I felt that they were under this umbrella of protection. And, and that was a beautiful thing to realize in my case, um, during the process of making the movie. And, and at the same time, I think that there's a fairy tale here that she challenges. Uh, that's why we have said, and we, we thought from the very beginning, and this is, I'm quoting Steve Knight, that he was saying all the time that it was an upside down fairy tale. And he was saying that it's a jailbreak movie. And, and the upside down fairy tale comes from, you know, a very simple logic that she was sort of chosen, right? That that's how it is. She's not, not even invited. She was chosen to be, the princess and later the potential queen. And she eventually decides not to be that person and walks away from the family. And, and that, that, that act is very unusual and makes her very strong and, and gives her, to her life a very powerful, I think, a statement. And, and thought that it was just a beautiful way to bring that into the story and understand that she was the princess that was finally walking out of that castle, was, you know, rejecting the family and, and being herself and not saying, I'm not going to be your queen because I just don't fit in here. And why she doesn't fit in there, that's probably where the movie's heart is, I think. I mean, one of the things I really loved about the film is the way in which you position so many of, of the royal family at the peripheries, they're almost invisible. And this thing you were discussing, the empathy, you show that empathetic relationship through the relationship she has with her own children, which is very much centered, her, her, her role as a mother rather than as a princess, but also the relationship she has with some of the staff at Sandringham. So the guy who's uh, a wonderful performance from Sean Harris is Darren, um, who's, you know, the, 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 the head of the kitchens and her dresser played by Sally Hawkins, Maggie. And you begin to see how that empathy was created. Um, and I think they're beautiful relationships where you were always very conscious that you were recentering Diana to focus away from those um, relationships with, with um, uh, her husband and her mother-in-law and the wider royal family to these very personal relationships with staff, uh, as well as the relationship with her children that you've already talked about. Yeah, look, what happens is that more than avoiding, uh, you know, uh, the family, what I think Steve did originally, uh, and I followed that really, really close to the script because I thought it was really interesting and, and brilliant, is that instead of ignoring the family because of the sake of ignoring them, what we did is that just to turn around to the people that she was actually talking to, to in, in her life. She was you know, very isolated in, 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 in this uh, castle and family. And, and, and especially in the years that the movie takes place, uh, which is somewhere, it's early 90s, it's, ba it's basically loose. You could say 1990, 1991, 1992, some, around those three years. And, and so what we did was really focus on the people that she had relationship with. Mm. Um, and of course, Shan plays a, um, really well, by the way, wonderful actor, uh, plays, um, the chef, uh, who's based on a real chef uh, that actually worked in, in, in the house uh, in those days. And then she also was very close to the dresser, who in, which is Maggie in the movie, and it's played by Sally Hawking. Um, and, and so she had more interest in those people than in the family. And, and it was a good way to do it because with them, with the staff members, she would probably behave in a way that felt more real and more honest and more candid. She would always um, be with people that felt closer to the way that she saw life. Uh, and we were just talking about it. She saw herself, and I think she actually was, as a more regular woman. She, she keeps saying that she liked fast food and she liked pop music and she liked the musicals, you know, Les Miserables so, and, and all these, you know, sort of uh, cultural elements that they were really, really for more mid-class and, and regular people from, from in, in, in England. So 
she was more tend to talk to them. And, and we thought that it was a beautiful opportunity to really get to know her well. Because if you would spend more time with member of the royal family, you would likely to be um, having her with a shield in front. So I, I think that with, with most of the scenes that she has with, with Charles and, 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 the, and a brief encounter with the queen and, and the other scenes, she's always trying to behave properly, which is something that she was most of the time being, you know, asked to, you know, the, the, there's this sensation that people is always asking Diana to be properly the princess and behave as she should. So, so it was, a, it was a, a good angle. And, and of course, as you say, with the kids, uh, that, that she had her own world with them. And, and, and I think, um, that is where, what, what, what we try to do. Uh, let's see what, what the audience thinks, but, but I think it gives the movie a different energy because we are seeing the real Diana most of the time and not someone that is behaving in front of a member of the family or to the press or to the, you know, to the public eye. She's always, or most of the time in the movie, being truth, truth, truth to herself and to what she really was. And, and I think that is an exceptional perspective. I mean, it's lovely. I mean, she, she appears as a playful character in, in the film. There's great moments of comedy when she kind of answers back, which are a lot of fun. But I really love the way that you've created a playful film in moving across genres. There are moments where, you know, Sandringham is like a haunted house. And, and you do feel that, that, you know, this is a woman who is being haunted by the weight of history and the weight of expectations on her. And you, you play with the idea of, of the ghost story, I think, beautifully. Um, uh, and I won't give too much away, but there are, you know, there are historical figures that watch over her and haunt her in, in, in the film. So were you always very conscious of this wishing to kind of play with genre, so to speak, and introduce that playfulness into the film? Well, it, it, it I, again, it, it came from the script, first of all. And then I was, when I read it, I was very happy because I, I felt that, that, as you say, we, we had the chance to play with, with different tones and style. And, and that's something that I've cared, um, uh, you know, for the, in the movies that I've made to, to, to sort of create a, a mood that is hard to describe, you know, and, and that's where the, the cinema has more weight. Um, so yes, we, we worked around that and, 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 and there's something that, that she says that I, I think, I don't think I'll spoil it because I believe it's in the trailers around. She says, in this place, in this house, there is no future mm. and past and present are the same thing. Mm. Um, when I read that, I kind of understood a lot about, you know, what she could be feeling and what she was going through. And of course, in this, in, in a family that has uh, 1200 years, and that's been um, circulating about a very similar tradition, whoever is in, in there, uh, inside of those rooms, um, the only new element in there is just them, because everything else is just the same for, it's been there for, for many, many years. So I thought it was a, a good and interesting opportunity to have her um sort of embody um different uh perceptions that could sometimes be very tender mm -hmm. and sometimes very horrific um and i think that psychological state the psychological state that she had would likely be um, a good opportunity to show you know, what were her ghosts and 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 this is what i wouldn't want to spoil the movie but there's something that it's going inside of her that I think we work really hard to get to connect with, with her and, and, and to be feeling what she was feeling and understanding what she was going through. Even though many of those things are very hard to explain, I think that thanks to the performance and the script and the way we made the movie, how we shot it, you could actually feel that sometimes you're in a family drama, sometimes you are in a royal drama, and, and, or a melodrama, and sometimes you are inside of a ghost movie where certain elements coming from the psychological terror can exist, and certain elements that are coming are coming from a woman that it's 
going through a you know a big deal of a crisis um, can eventually see and experience things that are just only happening inside of her. Um, and that sort of crosses on different tones and moods could deliver a piece of movie that has a, um, a specific tone um, where I have to say, uh, Johnny Greenwood's music, you know, they do a very strong um, sort of support and they're a, a very essential element because I, I believe that his music um, sort of was, was able to really help the movie to take off and, and, and visit those places that, that we were um, flirting with and, and, and they became real and, and those emotions are um, more defined. Because what I think it happens is that there, there's one thing that is the image, right? And, and, and it has a track, the, the narrative, the visuals and whatever we shot. And then, then another, another element, um, all this is quite obvious, but it's just, just so beautiful to see it happening. Uh, and there's another element, which is it's music, right? And, and how, how the music has its own space and voice. And then when you put them together, in reality is that they both create a third element and that is where the cinema exists and 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 there's something in the music that is a transit in between baroque music and jazz and, and that is a, a very unusual um uh, mix it's like i don't know having haydn uh, played uh, with uh, child mingus and in a in a and, and all that in visiting uh, Johnny's wing with uh, heart and computer <laughs> and talent and, and sensibility, um, but it was it 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 did make a change and and did and did help to uh, sort of put the movie in the right tone when when we need it. So I'm I'm happy that that we actually got to work with someone that I I have such an admiration. So, so yeah. Well, I loved because it, for me, it felt like those different worlds colliding, that very formalistic Baroque structure against the kind of freewheeling jazz. So it was a brilliant way of, of suggesting how these two worlds are kind of coming into, into conflict in the film. So it was a beautiful analogy for what was happening in terms of Diana's um, kind of confrontation with, for example, the, the wonderful character played by Timothy Spall, Major Gregory, who is there to uphold the, the whole system, you know, and, and it's a wonderful performance by him. His impassive kind of face, it reminded me a little bit of Alfredo Castro in your earlier yeah, films. He's I, I so felt the same with him. Read. He's so difficult to read. It's yeah. wonderful. You, you know, what, what happened is that uh, it's interesting because what we end up uh, doing with the music uh, that Johnny did is that most of the Baroque music, not, not all the time, but most of the time, would usually. Um, was we used it with 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 the royal situations, right? And and more connected with things around tradition and and the family, and then the jazz was really used with her. Um, if you, if you see that most of the jazz pieces, uh, particularly the, the the trumpet, which is very strong and, and very relevant when 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 it's played in in, in cinema, I think they they really work with well with her so what we end up doing is that most of the jazz is is when she's by herself and she's going through a specific situation by herself and it's beautiful because it's really you know it comes from the the the, the free jazz tradition mm -hmm. and it's a type of composition where where musicians would would improvise around specific ideas um and and then of course uh, the Johnny would edit and, and, and create the music. But, but what I want to say is that she was the spirit of that freedom, of that free jazz that represents not only a type of music, but also a spirit of, of freedom and, and identity. So it, it kind of worked and fit really well that, that, that in one hand we had the, the Baroque being you know, in, in the heart of, the, of the, the more traditional elements and then the free jazz and the jazz in the heart of herself and, and how it would sort of support this idea of, of freedom. And then, yes, I, I've been a, a big, big fan of, of Tim Spall and, and Sally Hawkins, both of them, uh, thanks to Mike Lee's movies. 
uh, and in the case of of team, um, I I felt that I was you know with someone that I've met for so many years, probably thanks to Alfredo Castro and and the people that have worked here, because team comes from the theater world and 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 he's um, such a brilliant and and like any or every genius, just such a fun person. He's really fascinating and fun and, and easy to work with. That was my experience at least. And I, and I had a, a good big, big connection with him. I think he really, really affected me when we were working in, a, in the most beautiful way. And he does this very mysterious person that represents tradition. Is someone who kind of represents the idea of loyalty to the crown and how the crown somehow represents the spirit of of of, of Great Britain, no, and and, and the kingdom. Um, and he explained that he took an oath, you know, and what is that oath means, and why he, as a soldier, as a, as a member. Uh, of, of the army um, was someone that was willing to uh, lose his life for, for the crown. And he wonders what is what that means. And then we have in the other side, someone like, like Diana, who's not really connecting with that. And so the friction that, that Kristen and Tim created for the movie was, was very relevant. And, and, and as you say, it, it works well because they look and feel that they come from just different planets. Absolutely. And really struggle to read each other. I think that that tension is at the heart of the, and the film. Tell me a little bit about your work um, on the film with uh, cinematographer uh, Claire Mathon, who, of course, uh, shot Portrait of a Lady on Fire. You'd worked um, uh, for six films with uh, Sergio Armstrong from Tony Manero to Neruda. Um, and here you chose to work with Claire. And, and as you said earlier, the look of your films, the, the idea of how you conjure mood is so very important. And what we get in um, Spencer is this very cold world of, um, of Sandringham and, and, and the palace and, the, and that kind of glacial coldness emerges so clearly and so crisply in the, in, in, in the film. And, and this regimentalized world from the very beginning where we see the soldiers kind of coming in, uh, bringing in the food to the shooting party at the end. There's something exquisite in the way in which that reg regimentalized culture that she literally kind of darts and dances through um, is, is constructed. So tell me a little bit about uh, the production design for the film and the work with Claire on the lighting of the film, which is just extraordinary. Yeah, they're, they're wonderful. I, we, we had the chance to, to work with a uh, guy, Hendrik Diaz, who I, I was just coming from a, a television show we, we did together in the United States. And, and then Claire, as, as you say, Claire Mathon, who, um, such a wonderful uh, person and 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 DP. Yeah, we. It, it's interesting because I think that it was a very interesting mix because I feel that Guy did a very accurate one side um, sort of palace and and house and and and, and visuals, and at the same time. Um, all the all our references and the things that the movie that we discussed that they were like from Stanley Kubrick to uh, to Orson Welles and and, and 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 certain movies that felt cold and that then the that the space and the physicality of the space would represent the oppression and the tradition the history was filmed by someone like Claire who is a very warm filmmaker that can sort of have a very tender um, and not naive, but but very um, sort of a human approach. So it was a very interesting combination because that created a, a crisis and a friction between both both takes. Um, and of course, it's something that we discussed in, in between the three of us. Um, and and Claire, what 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 she what what she does is that she was also able to get along really well with Kristen. You know, the, the, the movie was shot um, often in a, in, with handheld and, and some of those framings can be very intimidating for the actors because it's really close, it's this distance. Um, so it was, it was, I was curious to see how Kristen and, and Claire were, were going to get along and, and it worked really well. And it was very interesting to see how they were, you know, eventually kind of dancing together, and how it it they create a very interesting energy, 
because I felt in a more, you know, in my perspective that it, it is it, it it's hopefully a more poetic vision that with with the sets that that guy and his and his team created, that there was a coldness, you know, that as as I said, just represent tradition and 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 represent the family and represent the thing that he was struggling with, and at the same time. There was this sort of tender approach. It was one more warm with, with a, a texture of watercolors. And we shot it on 16 millimeters, most of it, and a little bit in 35. So it had this, this sort of palette of colors that is very unusual and, 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 and very feminine, I think. And, and, and so it's, it's the Claire's camera came in to save her and to to protect her from that environment. So it was a beautiful thing to see how they worked. I, I usually operate the camera myself uh, often and I start doing it and share the camera with Claire, but at some point I just, you know, stop doing it and and, and let Claire uh, keep shooting and, and, and she showed most of it because they, they, they really got it well and, and she was doing something that I could probably never do. Um, and and yeah and, and it's 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 uh it's it's interesting because you know most of the of movies and, and television nowadays they work with a high contrast type of photography mm -hmm. which is meaning that that the distance in between black and white is very high and the blacks are very dark and the whites are very bright and everything else is in the in, in the middle right in the grayscale and 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 claire uh work with with a very sort of uncontrast image and and that gives it a very particular uh, type of palette um, that I think fits really well her psychology and her sensuality and her femini femininity and 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 yeah it, it was a it was a, a joy of shooting I, I remember when we wrapped I, I said to everyone that I would keep making shooting that movie for another two months I was very sad when we when we read it was such a, an incredible experience to, to make it. Tell me a little bit about um, parallels with Jackie because one of the things when I first uh, saw Spencer I thought like Jackie you're focusing on a very tight time period here again you've got two icons of um, uh, uh, well women icons of uh, the late 20th century, second half of the 20th century, that you're representing, you're seeing a different side of them. And both women who were part of influential families. Um, and and uh, But obviously, I mean, with, with Jackie, you've got a very claustrophobic focus with the camera is literally on top of her. And with Diana, the camera follows her, but it also gives her space, I think. And there's some wonderful moments where she dances around where the camera is, is, is following her, not on top of her, but with almost a respectful dif dif distance. So tell us a little bit about, because obviously on, on a narrative level, there are some parallels or a lot of contrast between the two films, but, but you do go back to these icons. You know, Neruda is another film where you're dealing with the construction of an icon and looking beyond the surface in complex and, and difficult ways and playing with genre across all three of those films. Well, yeah, I think, I think that, that there are a number of things that you could probably consider that they're similar, uh, that, that they're, they're parallels to be made. They're both iconic women from the 20th century, played by iconic actresses, I believe, um, um, that, um, that they had to deal with, with an enormous amount of crisis and they had to understand how to deal with media. And, and the movie sort of also shows, both movies shows how media affect them. Um, and they were both mothers, and they were both uh, people that that struggled to find their own identity, and they they finally can can find themselves in the process of each movie. So of course there there, there are things in, in common, but but at the same time, um, there there are things that are very different, I believe. Um, and when, in one side where with Jackie, uh, it's a movie about grief. Um, and it feels more like a requiem. Um, I feel that that probably Spencer, it's more a movie about uh, identity and motherhood <clears throat> uh, that feels more like a release movie. Um, and then Jackie's probably as well a movie <clears throat> about how um, 
uh, a woman is, 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 is shaping the legacy of her husband and by doing so creates her own identity. So it's really also a movie about memory, I think, and about how you can shape uh, history and how could you leave a trace on history uh, throughout a very um, sort of intimate portrait of yourself and how by the tragedy of, of someone else, even if that person is your husband, you end up uh, sort of creating your own identity. I think that's that's what Jackie is and, and what Natalie did so beautiful in, in that movie. And, and in, in the other side, I think that probably Spencer, it's, it's more a movie about a person that is, you know, living a family. It's, it's creating a different type of legacy, which is not about the legacy of her husband, but it's about her legacy of herself. And then and in the other side, it's someone that gets to understand that the most important thing that she has in her life is their kids. And she would find her identity in, 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 in her own private family and she doesn't need anyone to keep going. So those are kind of uh, the, the parallels, but, but of course there are people that, that had a huge impact on fashion and that had a, probably they were both the most photographed persons in the 20th century, I believe. Um, and at the same time, uh, they were women that probably you know, could transcend over time in a very similar way, or sometimes in the case of Diana, probably stronger than, than her husband's and even family. Um, but yeah, I, I, I never planned to do both. I was invited by Darren Aronofsky to make Jackie. And then, uh, you know, luckily enough, uh, Natalie accepted and, and, and we made the movie. And then we decided to make this movie I don't, I don't know exactly why, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy we did them both. And I think they, they work together in an interesting way, I believe. Yeah. And both films, obviously, film, your, your two films made in English as well. Is it very different when you're working in English and not in your native Spanish? Well, it, it is at the beginning when you have to sort of get into elements that are far from your culture. Uh, but then once you're in the you're actually making the movie, it feels very similar. I think that's what is incredible about cinema, that movies are made in the same way all over the world. I've, I've been lucky to visit people's sets in different countries and contexts and periods of my life, and movies are made in the same way. So I, I don't know, if you think about, for example, uh, you know, Claire is from France and, and I'm from Chile and Kristen is American and everyone else was, was British. And, uh, you know, part of our production team is English, of course, with Paul Webster. And then it's Jonas and Janine and Maren from, from Completion in Germany. And we shot most of the movie in Germany. So it was a, a big cocktail of people, countries, identities. And, and I think that the things that, that, you know, work well because they're universal. And, and, and that's what I think cinema does. I, I don't, I'm 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 a lucky I'm you know I'm a lucky person that I I was I had a good education and, and I was able to learn English and so I I'm, I'm happy because of that. But besides the language barrier, I, I don't I don't see a big difference. I think cinema is pretty much a thing that we all do in the same way. It's interesting, isn't it? I was thinking about the parallels with your earlier films set in Chile. And one of the things I think that they share, um, uh, that Tony Manero, No and Postmortem, which of course came to be seen as a trilogy about Pinochet's Chilean emerging from dictatorship to democracy, um, all, all deal with history. They're all about the forging of history. How do you review history? How do you engage with history? How do you dissect history? Um, and, and uh, you know, it seems to me that's a really important trait that runs through so much of your, of your filmmaking. Talk us through um, uh, some of those earlier uh, films, specifically Tony Manero and Noah and Postmortem, which seem to me one of the most compromised and direct engagements with the culture of, of, of dictatorship and, and, and the kind of culture that, that promotes, I'm thinking about post-mortem, 
the ways in which a dictatorship begins to establish its, its order or its, its, its regime. I think there are three wonderful films about power and the way in which power is, is navigated and negotiated and abused. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, we, th what I think we, we did with those movies, specifically with Tony Monero and Postmortem, I think no runs in a, kind of a little bit of a different track, but those two movies are, are really about the consequences of, of, of the dictatorship. And it's, it's the consequence of the consequence of the consequence, meaning it's, it's to really put the eye on, on someone that is really far from power and that is just a victim of a social process that can go in, 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 in such a difficult situation and can really be a metaphor of abuse and, 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 and somehow could explain how the logic of injustice and spacism can really affect um, the day by day of people that is not really in the front line. And, and that's why uh, doing a movie around a character named Raul Peralta that is played by Alfredo Castro, um, uh, that it's a, it's a guy that wants to win a TV contest uh, being the lookalike of John Travolta's Saturday Night Fever, who was released in Chile in 1978. And that person struggles with their own identity and ultimately becomes, you know, the result of the social process that we are experiencing. And he becomes a social, you know, a, a psychopath, a, a serial killer. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and yeah, so it, in, and then in postmortem, it's about a man who works in the morgue um, uh, during the days of the queue and basically starts seeing how a pile of bodies that are being executed, people that was executed by the military during the coup um, in, in September 11 of 1973. And they were drawn, you know, just as like insects. Um, people that with almost no identity, they were just throwing, you know, like animals or whatever in, in this morgue. In, so our, this person eventually also becomes a, a killer. It's also a, a person that it's, you know, is thrown and, 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 and changed by what he's experienced. So these ideas of oppression were really, you know, based on impunity and how our characters can absorb that and eventually become that. Um, and, and, and that transit in, in, in being this unknown regular citizen uh, and become you know, a metaphor and, and a reality of that oppressive system, um, it, that transit in between those two points is, is what the, those movies do. And, and it was interesting to, to, to kind of do that. It, and, and I think that would be related with, with No in the way that the three main characters, uh, both played in those two movies by Alfredo and then by Gael Garcia Bernal in, in the third one, they are um, just uh, somehow an element of, of someone that might be closer or further out from, from what it's going on in the reality in, in the country. Of course, in the case of Gael in, in No, he was closer. But they are people that they get to understand. And if they, they don't, they're a victim of that. If you do not connect with the reality of your social situation, you would become a victim of it. Mm. So if you don't have an active role on what's really going on, you could easily become a victim. And that's the reality of those two first movies, and it's the lesson that I guess Raul Peralta takes from uh, the, the, the experience that he has in No. So from what is, I think it, just looking back, which is not a great thing, I, 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 I always think that it's not good to look back, never look back as they say, but, mm -hmm. but just quickly looking back, those three movies were about people that was a little bit outside of the system, more or less, and they would see the people that was actually running and making the changes far from them. And then I went to do Neruda and, and Jackie and now Spencer, that they're really centered in the people that were
were <clears throat> in the heart of the situation and they were in the spotlight and they were um, in, in the first sort of, in, in the foreground of, of everything. So, so that was probably a big transit for me to, to kind of travel in between the people that <clears throat> they were outside of the heart of it into the people that was right in the middle. And, and I don't know <clears throat> if I could have ever made Neruda, Jackie, and Spencer before those three movies. I think the process for me was very interesting in the way that it happened, and I felt it was just better. I mean, you've just talked about Gal Garcia Bernal and, and, and Alfredo Castro, and you've worked with Gael on No, Neruda, and Emma, and you've worked with Alfredo uh, on uh, the, the trilogy we've just uh, been talking about, uh, Tony Monero, No, and Postmortem but also the club where it's a wonderful performance as the obsessive compulsive Father Vidal in a house where a group of Catholic priests have been uh, ostracized, exiled from, from, from society where they're, they're, you know, they're, 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 there's some sort of penitence or some sort of jail, the two things kind of intersect. But also he plays, of course, the president uh, in, in Neruda, the president. So, you know, you've got, with, yeah. with Alfredo, you've got an actor who's capable of being a complete nobody, somebody you wouldn't, well, you wouldn't notice, as with the, the character of Marco uh, in, um, in Postmortem, the kind of person that you walk past that blends into the walls to the president of Chile. He is a remarkable actor. Um, I remember many years ago when we spoke, you talked about him as the best actor on the planet, Alfredo Castro. Tell me a little bit about your working relationship with him and why you go back or went back to working with him regularly and also with, with Gael, because clearly with both you've established a special working relationship. Of course, you know, um, what, what I think, well, first of all, uh, Alfredo um, was my teacher, right? I, I I was a student in his in his uh, drama school and uh, here in Santiago, and so he had a, a huge impact and influence on me, um, you know, in in the theater that he did for so many years. So, yeah, I think that you know he can be a very fragile and and a very tender and a very dangerous person, you know, really easily, and 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 I think. Um, what I can say about him is that the big, big lesson that I got from him, it was that maybe it's not something that he necessarily taught me. Uh, he taught me many things, but others. But this is something that I get to, got to understand after working with him, because I keep asking me, what is what he has that I care so much and I, you know I, I'm so into into his work and, and and I'm so curious and I keep looking at him and filming him for movies after movies um, and and I think that it's just his mystery you know it's someone that it's eventually undescribable and and that where art has to be I think that you as, as when you can describe certain things um, then they aren't interesting anymore, I think. And and someone with the the you know sort of the intellect, the voice, the enigma, and the mystery of of, of Alfredo, you know, made me really understand cinema, and, and and made me sort of get get to a point where I felt comfortable working with actors that I feel they're mysterious, and and that's the first thing that I look in an actor, and and even though they're you know, many, many differences in between Alfredo, Gael, uh, Mariana Girolamo, and Natalie Portman, and, and, and Tim Spall, Sally Hawkins, and, and of course, uh, Kristen, and, and most of the actors that I work with, what I look in an actor is exactly what I learned from Alfredo, which is the level of enigma. And, and, and when I say enigma and mystery, it's, it's a, what I do, it's a very simple exercise, which is, just put them in front of the camera and give them no um, instructions and have them sit there uh, or just standing in front of the camera and, and then just ask them to inhabit the space and just to be present. <clears throat> and that very singular, simple instruction, it's, it's the one that when you look at them on a monitor, because let's not forget that this is not theater, you all go through a lens, right? And then through a monitor, and that's how you get to see it or a screen. 
you really wonder what's going on inside of them and you wonder what is about to happen. And then when they are performing, like look at what, what Kristen does, even though she might sometimes express what she's feeling. And sometimes she could be very eloquent and graphic in, in her emotions and what she's going through. You don't really know what is really going on inside of her. And that is the key of cinema because that is an audience that is active, trying to understand and process what is going on. And why? Because then they have to put, the audience has to put their own biography in front of the situation that they're being, they're, 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 they're seeing in a movie <clears throat> and determine what they're seeing thanks to who they are. So the movie works differently in each person and have a different sort of emotional connection. And I, and I think that interaction in between, um, you know, the actors and, and the audience is essential. And again, it's, it's about how undescribable an actor can and I think should be. You've recently uh, worked on a uh, Stephen King adaptation, uh, Lisey's story, uh, a series. Um, but, but before that, of course, you'd worked on um, Fugitives, Profusio, in, in, uh, with your own production company, Fabulous. Tell me about what's different in working in television and, and, and does it present different demands on you as a, as a director, the format of the episodic? Yeah, it is, it is different because, because I think that one of the things that I've learned over the process is that you have to manage the intensity in a different way. Um, a movie, no matter how long it is, it's always a short run. And when you have a longer sort of process with more episodes, you have to look at a, a, at a bigger scope and a different um, sort of rhythm of the entire process. Um, and at the same time, um, what happens, I think, is that the crafting is different because when, when you make a movie, um, and let's see what happens now that COVID is hopefully finally going and people's getting going back to the cinemas. But when you make a movie, you know that you have the audience's entire attention and you know that no phones, no lights, no sounds, no other things would interrupt the experience. So, so when you're editing a movie, you know that you could probably extend the shot as long as, as, as you think the audience would be interested in looking at that. When you, when you make television, the rhythms are different and, and you know that the, the audience could be, you know, sort of attacked by external elements. Mm -hmm. So you need to do it in a way that you keep their attention and, and that becomes a different crafting. That's in, that is in one thing. Um, and at the same time, I think that what is great about television is that you can really extend certain things that you would never be able to feed on, 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 a, on a movie. And, and in the television show we just did um, uh, for Apple um, with uh, Julianne and, and Clive, uh, Julianne Moore and Clive Owen that play the main roles and, and a number of incredible American actors too. Um, we shot for so long and, and Steve King did a, you know, did a, a very fantastic work um, adapting his own novel. Um, but it's the type of work that that requires a lot of information because it's it's really a you know it's a very thick novel that it would be impossible to translate into a, a movie. I, I, or if you do that, you would have to take out many elements that, uh, that we all thought they were fascinating. So it is different mediums, and I think that the biggest the biggest difference is is the intensity. You you would never be able to have an an opera from Wagner, for example, that could last eight or 16 hours, it would, it would, it would have to, it, it has to be compressed to two or three or whatever they last, but you can't, because it's too intense. And, and I, I, I like to think about that in, 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 in movies, that if you, if you translate that to, to television, you have to sort of to be more, more, more subtle and kind of slow cooked uh, in a way. Um, I think. Before we finish, I'd like to ask you about your relationship 
with your brother, the producer Juan de Dios um, La Reyn and Fabula Films, the, the, the company you set up in 2003. What has that working relationship enabled? Because it seems to me it's given you an immense control over your own work and freedom over your own work, but also um, your own work, Pablo, alongside your brother as a producer of some of the most important other directors emerging from Chile. And I'm thinking about Sebastián Lelio, of course, and a Gloria, fantastic woman, which you, uh, which was produced by Fabula and, and Gloria Bell, um, and other filmmakers that you've worked with. So tell me a little bit about that working relationship, because it's always reminded me a little bit of the Almodovar brothers and El Deseo and, and the freedom that it gave them to produce their own work on their own terms, but also to produce work by other emerging and established filmmakers. Yeah, well, it, it's 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 wonderful because um, you know my brother and I are very close, of course, and we've been working. Our company is going to turn eighteen years quite soon um, in November, and and I think that part of the key of the way that we work is that we do very different things and and we actually even though we agree in a lot of things we see things really different and i guess that that has helped us to uh, to move along um and and i feel very lucky to to have him because i'm 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 a person that i've been able to really focus in in, in my work and in 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 developing you know but things that are interesting to me and and make him interested in, in what I'm doing. And, and then by doing so, um, he became an incredible producer. And, and you know, he's, he's actually running our company. I obviously am there, I help, and, but they have a different role. I'm, I'm more in the creative side and I, and I help in, in, in other things. But he's the, you know, the, the, the big engine that, that keeps the things running. Um, and as you said, it's, it's true. It's, it's, it's what, what has come up by the end of the road is that we have had the freedom of, of being making, uh, you know, the content that we like. And at the same time, um, we have had the chance to, to produce other filmmakers that I deeply admire. And, and one of the things that happens with, with the filmmakers that you, you never, because of the nature of filmmaking, directors unlike everyone else on a on a movie uh, only really work in their own movies and every every other person that eats in a movie usually goes and work with different directors and it can be that can be a fascinating experience I, I wish I could do that but the the way that I personally have been able to do that was thanks to my brother and his sort of capacity and I've joined him that that's the truth uh, to support uh, certain movies or a few movies that we have made in, in, in the last, uh, I don't know, 15 years. And, and some of them are fantastic. Like for example, the work of Sebastian Lelio um, <clears throat> and Mariali Rivas and, and, and other filmmakers that I really admire. And, and I you know, had the luck to, to be present and support them in, in, in some capacity in, the, in their work. But, but I think that we have understand over the process. And I think part of the success if there's any in, in our company is that we respect the voices of the filmmakers that we work with. We want to work with them because we admire them and we want to work with them in a way that they feel that they are free and they can make the movie they want to do. And we're not there to tell them what's the movie they should do. We always say what we think, but we'd not impose anything. And that is, I guess, the key of, uh, of, of, of what we've been doing in, in these years. And, but uh, as I said, it's it's mostly you know uh, my brother and I, and I feel I'm, I'm I'm very lucky to have been able to to be his partner for all these years. Before we finish, I mean Spencer's wonderful. We're delighted to have it in the festival. What can we look forward to? What's next for uh, Pablo Larraín? What's your next film? I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what's going to be. Um, I think it's. Uh, it's it's uh, it's not good not good luck to talk about things that aren't made yet, but I'm I'm writing and I have two things on on process. Let's see what what will eventually happen. But um, I'm excited to to 
to support the movie. I think there's a long road and, and we have to, you know, um, help the movie in, in the release in different countries and, um, and, and there might be also some work uh, maybe related to awards. We, we, don't, we don't know, but it, it, it could happen. So we're, we're here and, and I think movies are, are babies that, that need, they need they need care for for a long time, and I don't know. I I I started making movies among other reasons because I loved cameras and sets and movies. But I I've never wanted to be in front of the camera, and here I am, you know. And and uh, but it, it's it's fine. That I I've learned over the, the years that you have to you know help the movies and, and protect them until they're really out there and they have their own life. And I, and I think we're close to, to that response, but not there yet. But I'm extremely excited to, to have the movie in, in, in the London Film Festival because um, one of the things that, that it, it's very interesting specifically in, in, in this movie, and obviously the, the fact that I am not English really helps to that, is that I want to see how they react to this movie. And I'm very curious to see what the audience sees in, in, in a movie like this. Um, so yeah, it's exciting, let's see. Well, Pablo, thank you so much for the care you've taken in talking to us today about, about this film and also your wider body of work. And thank you for leaving us with the mystery that we don't quite know uh, what's coming next. Um, and mystery, as you've reminded us right through this interview, is core to cinema. Pablo Larraín, thank you so thank very you so much. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Bye bye, Maria. <laughs>